Hey, welcome back to Dinosaurs. Uh, we've reached another milestone in the class as we are now uh, essentially through module three. This is the last lecture in module three. We're going to talk about the big old sauropod dinosaurs, the long necked, uh, just super sauruses, the very, very large herbivorous dinosaurs. But before we do that, let's do some announcements. So if you miss it, you missed it. And I don't have a lot of options to make it up because grades are due. Uh, pretty soon thereafter. All right, so let's review uh, sauropodomorpha. So today we're going to talk about the true sauropods. Uh, last time we talked about sort of the more basal sauropodomorpha, just like we talked about earlier, the very basal theropod dinosaurs, and then transitioned into the more derived uh, versions like the Tyrannosauroidea, the Dromosauria, and eventually the aves, the birds. Uh, we're going to walk up through these basal forms, or we did, and today we're going to delve into the more dry forms. So uh, what's the general trend seeing the diets of Sauropodomorpha? So take a look at those options there, and remember that their ancestors were uh, archosaurs that were bipedal carnivores. So what's the trend seen throughout the Sauropodomorpha? And uh, they start trending towards herbivory. So there is more omnivory. And by the time we get to the end of the Sauropodomorpha, uh, we've uh, moved away from that ancestral primitive carnivore condition, moving kind of more away from the primitive bipedal stance and more towards these more massive quadrupedal or tending towards quadrupedal herbivorous dinosaurs, and that's a slow transition over time, uh, not an immediate uh, big jump. Uh, the next question, so what's the general trend seen in the body and necks of sauropodomorpha? So looking at all those sauropodomorpha that we talked about last time, uh, what's the general evolutionary trend throughout that lineage? Uh, there are some examples there on the picture, although it doesn't really show that trend all that well. Uh, the overall trend is uh, towards larger body size and longer necks. And so we, again, you see here a, a human for scale, uh, Platyosaurus, the largest of the dinosaurs from the Triassic period. Uh, this growing of the sauropod dinosaurs, uh, perhaps in response to growing of the carnivorous dinosaurs, or is it the other way around and sauropod dinosaurs are growing in response to just uh, more plant material available, uh, more productivity in the environment, and then it's kind of an arms race where the sauropods are getting bigger and the carnivorous dinosaurs, the theropods, get bigger uh, in response to that. So pretty interesting little uh, arms race going on. All right, so let's look at the Sariscia cladogram so again, all of Dinosauria is split into the two big clads, the Ornithischia, the bird-hipped dinosaurs, and the Saurischia, the lizard-hipped dinosaurs. The Saurischia branch off into kind of these basal Saurischians and the theropods, which eventually is the bird line. Aves is part of Theropoda, which again, keep in mind, that's kind of weird because the birds are not bird-hipped dinosaurs. That's interesting. Remember that it's a convergent evolution where they evolve a similar solution to a similar problem uh, in at a different time and a different evolutionary lineage. Uh, we talked about all the theropods. That was the first start of this module. Uh, now we're going to talk about the sauropodomorpha, or the sauropodomorpha, and particularly the very advanced sauropods. Uh, and then next module, we're going to talk about the ornith ornithischian uh, bird-hipped dinosaurs. Uh, so let's take a closer look at sauropodomorpha. Uh, we saw this slide last time. It's uh, sauropodomorpha means lizard foot form. This is all of the sauropod forms, which again includes the largest land animals to ever exist. And to reinforce that, we have that trend that we saw on the review there from kind of the basal primitive carnivorous form towards omnivory, towards full herbivory. Uh, we also see in response, if you're going to be an herbivore and processing massive quantities 
of plant material, generally having a large body size is beneficial. So think about large herbivorous mammals like cows, uh, moose, uh, you're seeing an increase in body size. Elephants, giraffes, uh, we're seeing large body size to accommodate that herbivorous lifestyle. If you're going to eat plants, you need a big old gut to process those plants and big body size becomes beneficial. Uh, we're also seeing along with that larger body size, a transition from bipedal walking on upright on two legs to facultative bipedal where they're uh, mostly bipedal, but they will occasionally walk on the front limbs for support uh, to fully quadrupedal where they're obligated to walk on four legs. Uh, it's necessary for them to walk on four legs. Uh, in some cases, they can't even briefly go on to two legs. Uh, it would just kind of cripple them. Uh, so looking at a uh, more detailed zoom in of the sauropoda, uh, sauropodomorpha in this case, uh, these are the ones that we talked about last time. We talked about these basal sauropodomorphs, and then we talked about the core pro sauropods. Uh, and again, we saw that transition, that increase in body size, that trend toward herbivory. Uh, we start seeing like cheeks and gnawing herbivorous teeth. Uh, we're going to see kind of a transition actually away from that particular aspect though. Uh, and uh, so let's get into the actual sauropoda. So sauropoda means lizard foot. Uh, and this, just this very narrow, more derived group, uh, this includes the, the very advanced, uh, very largest of the largest animals to ever exist. Uh, so these are the big, big ones. Uh, so th again, these true sauropods, they start seeing like a shorter snout. And again, another big step change in body size. We've seen this trend so far of increasing body size. And now uh, we take the next step in there and eventually get another step to like, again, the largest, the very largest things that have ever walked on land. And as we see that they become obligate quadrupeds uh, and they start developing these fleshy foot pads. So uh, we are used to seeing the theropod dinosaur three foot prints. Uh, we're gonna start to see uh, more fleshy kind of pad shapes, uh, prints. Uh, and again, from the bones, we don't necessarily see that fleshy pad, but we do see it in the trace fossils. So again, it's we need to incorporate the hard fossil evidence with the trace fossil evidence with, say, comparisons to modern animals. Uh, all of these are things that we can use to make good educated guesses, uh, educated inferences, educated interpretations about things that may not be directly represented in the fossil record, in the bone, the hard part fossil record anyways. Uh, and again, we see through time, the necks becoming more specialized, more elongate. We see the legs becoming more specialized, more stocky and stout to support that increased body weight. Again, this trend is fully on away from speed and running on two legs towards a lot more tank-like a lot stouter, a lot more robust. Uh, and then uh, again, the feet become more specialized. If you're gonna have bulky legs to support a bulky frame, the feet form the foundation of that. And we see some modifications to the feet to bear all this extra weight. Uh, here's just a kind of size comparison of just, you know, these things are truly massive. Uh, another thing we see is that they have different uh, neck stances. So some necks tend to be kind of more upright, some kind of in between, and some kind of are held generally more horizontally, uh, all to do with the setup of how the body is built, how the neck is positioned on that body frame, uh, the relative size of the four limbs to the hind legs to kind of give the body like a pitch. Uh, certain sauropods favor really high browsing in the high branches of the trees, uh, certain kind of more mid-level and certain are low browsers eating kind of ferns, maybe even kind of right off the ground. And so this is one way that they can sort of avoid competition with each other. And so many of these large sauropod herbivores can exist in the same environment because they're not competing for the exact same resources, kind of as we saw niche partitioning with the 
uh, theropods where like the larger, more robust forms were hunting more out in the open and the more slender gracile forms were hunting kind of in amongst the trees. Uh, so sauropods is a very uh, weird kind of body frame. Uh, it's, some, it's a body style and shape that we uh, don't really see a lot in modern animals. Uh, the obvious example that kind of jumps to mind is the giraffe. Uh, and so there's a couple issues that we need to answer with this general body size. And the first one is uh, blood flow. So how do these incredibly long neck sauropods uh, get blood all the way up their necks to their heads, to their brains? If you don't get oxygen to your brain, uh, you're not gonna be alive very long. Uh, it's a good way to die. <laughs> uh, and also if you've ever stood up too quickly, uh, and the blood rushes away from your head, you get kind of lightheaded and maybe like, in some cases you can even pass out. Uh, that's not something that you wanna have happening all the time. Uh, also, if you bend down, you feel kind of blood rushing to your head. Uh, you don't want that either. If it bends down to get a drink, you don't want blood pooling in the head or pooling in the legs. So how do they solve that? Well, uh, again, soft parts aren't really preserved in the fossil record. Uh, so looking towards modern animals helps. Now remember that giraffes are mammals and mammals are not ancestral to the dinosaurs. So it's a little bit of a leap to look at giraffes as an analog. We've been talking about phylogenetic bracketing, which is looking at bracketing of ancient animals and modern animals on the same evolutionary lineage. So like with the dinosaurs, we've been looking at crocodiles a lot. We've been looking at birds a lot. Uh, we haven't been looking at mammals a lot, but in this case, we kind of have to. Uh, there is no reptile that has kind of this body form. There's uh, maybe birds to a certain extent, but um, we've seen a lot of instances of convergent evolution though. Last homework was uh, flight developing. Flight developed in insects. Flight developed in pterosaurs. Flight developed in birds, uh, and then finally flight developed in mammals and bats. And so there were four different times in four different lineages. That was four different ways of how to solve that flight problem in pretty similar ways. Uh, and so this is another problem in evolution. If you're going to be a long-necked animal, how do you solve that problem? We can look at giraffes and kind of make the, uh, again, inference that long-necked dinosaurs probably solved these problems in similar ways. Evolution has a relatively limited toolkit to deal with this situation. And so what can we do as, remember we're all amniotes, we're all tetrapods. So if you go back far enough, we do have common ancestors, but they're not directly linked. So uh, how do giraffes solve this? Well, one way is that they have valves uh, in the vasculature in their necks, in the arteries and veins in their necks, so that if they raise their head up, quickly, the blood doesn't rush out. And if they drop their heads to say, get a drink, the blood doesn't rush to the head. There are restrictions, there are check valves in there that stop that from happening. It restricts the flow to kind of one way flow. Uh, there's also spongy tissue in their necks that sort of acts as sort of a passive pump. So as the neck is moving around, uh, it's sort of the spongy tissue kind of compresses a little bit and pumps the blood. Uh, in, in many ways, it can also sort of act as like a compression sock. So um, if you've ever traveled like overseas on a really long flight, uh, physicians recommend that you wear like spandex compression socks to prevent deep vein thrombosis. Uh, it keeps the blood from pooling down in your lower leg or in some cases in, in your, your arms, your extremities. So uh, this spongy tissue kind of acts as like a natural compression sock to keep the blood from pooling in the legs. Uh, they also need to get blood all the way up that long neck. And so they need a massive heart to pump lots of blood uh, with a really high blood pressure. So giraffes have the highest blood pressure of any animal known. And they also have uh, for their body size, a really massive heart. Uh, you can see this diagram here. You see how much of the giraffe's chest is actually taken up with the heart. Um, so, uh, before we looked at, before we kind of understood uh, giraffe, or at least before we use the giraffe analogy, there are a couple different solutions proposed. 
Uh, one was that they had hearts in their neck uh, to actually aid in pumping blood. And, and again, that's probably not true. Um, almost certainly not true. It would be very weird. Uh, it's probably really that spongy tissue that's sort of acting as almost like a passive pump. Uh, or Brachiosaurus never lifted its head above its shoulders. That's also not true. Um, by looking at the structure of the brain, by looking at the structure of the inner ear, the orientation of those channels in the inner ear, remember uh, inner ear is associated with balance. And by looking at the arrangement of the bones, you can tell the kind of neutral position of the head. Uh, some dinosaurs naturally have their heads pointed more downwards. Some have them pointed more forward and some have them naturally pointed more upwards, uh, depending on the orientation of the spinal column going into the skull. And so we can tell that from looking at uh, brain endocasts, which uh, skulls from sauropods are sort of rare. So it's not a lot of information on this, but uh, this is probably not true either. Uh, so what probably is true is that they had a massive strong heart uh, like giraffes, perhaps weighing several tons. So this is a, a truly colossal heart. They're very big hearted. Uh, another issue that sauropods would have that large animals have to this day, uh, particularly warm blooded mammals, is that they would tend to overheat. Again, uh, as you scale up the size of an organism, the surface area doesn't grow as quickly as the volume does. And so it becomes harder and harder and harder to get rid of all that heat that's internal to that mass. And so elephants solve it with their ears and by spraying water on themselves and rolling around in mud and things like that. Um, how did sauropods solve this? Well, uh, the initial mass calculations of sauropods kind of stated that, uh, first of all, there's no way that they could support themselves. They were just too massive and all of that weight would just crush their leg bones. And so they needed to be supported some other way. And the only way that early researchers could think of was that, okay, well, maybe they spend a lot of time in the water. Maybe they're mostly amphibious and that the water is supporting their weight. So like the largest animal ever in the history of the world uh, is the blue whale, the modern blue whale. Uh, it's much larger than the largest dinosaur because it doesn't have to support its own body weight. The water supports the body weight for it. Um, they all, this would also help them cool down. Uh, there's also, uh, their nostrils are located kind of higher up on their head, actually sort of above and behind the eyes. And this was initially thought that maybe it was like a snorkel so that they would be able to like stick their heads up and kind of breathe out of their foreheads. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what it turns out is that, um, again, these dinosaurs, the Saurischian dinosaurs that sauropods are part of, uh, the bird line is on this evolutionary line. And so they share some traits of birds. And we don't usually think about like massive herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs being fairly closely related to birds, but they're on that Saurischian line that ultimately gives rise to birds. And so they share some traits. One of the traits that they share is pneumatized bones where they have hollow air cavities inside their bones. Uh, you can see here in the bones, these divots and hollows. Uh, these are evidence of these air tubes, these air passages that are connected to these large internal air sacs. And so uh, making a sauropod dinosaur is not as simple as scaling up like an elephant. An elephant is a mammal. It doesn't have these pneumatized bones to lighten it. It doesn't have these air sacs. It only has the small-ish lungs. And so a dinosaur, a sauropod dinosaur is built much differently. Uh, it's built much lighter. So they have these robust limbs. Uh, and really the, uh, the upper portion of the dinosaur is lighter than we would think. And so these initial mass calculations were wrong. They didn't account for the fact that they're there's a lot of air inside the dinosaurs. It reduces their body weight, it reduces their body density, uh, and it also helps them exchange heat. Uh, it's a very efficient way to remove heat and carbon dioxide waste from the body. And so this sort of solves the sauropod overheating issue and answers the question of like how they got so big. Uh, just like with the theropod dinosaurs, the very derived largest forms, sort of start converging on like pretty close to the same-ish size, probably really pushing the limits of how big a theropod dinosaur can get. 
a bipedal theropod dinosaur. Uh, we start seeing at the end here where the largest quadrupedal sauropod forms start kind of converging on roughly the same size. Uh, and again, this is probably pushing the largest that they're capable of. It's probably the full extent of the tetrapod uh, four-legged uh, body plan. So uh, dinosaurs probably pushed the limits of size and this is one way that they did that. Uh, another problem that you're gonna have is drinking. So they had a drinking problem. Uh, how could sauropod dinosaurs bend down and drink without all the blood rushing to their heads? Uh, and then because their heads were oriented on their, on their necks like this, when they bent down to drink, their nostrils would be underwater. And so they wouldn't be able to breathe and drink at the same time. And it would take a lot of water to get down uh, that big old neck. Uh, so how do they solve that? Well, one way they solve them is that um, giraffes, to get their necks down, they have to actually spread their front limbs way apart in a very awkward uh, looking stance here to, to kind of dip down. And you see their nostrils are held just above the water surface there. Uh, and so their, their neck has to kind of bend outward a little bit more than sauropod necks probably are capable of doing. Um, but uh, dinosaurs probably didn't do this because if they did, uh, their legs would probably buckle under these stresses. And so they probably didn't do this. Uh, they used their necks. So they just kind of dipped down. Their necks are a little bit longer even than a giraffe neck is compared to their body size. And so they could just dip down. Um, and again, they have the valves to prevent unchecked blood flow. Uh, and they also may not have had to drink that much. Giraffes don't drink that often because they get a lot of the liquid that they need from their diet, from the plants that they eat. And sauropod dinosaurs were probably uh, fairly similar. Uh, another thing uh, that rises up here that's a big contention is their nostrils. Uh, so sauropod nares, the nasal opening and the skull, uh, not the actual fleshy nose nostril, but the skull opening uh, is located oddly high on their skull. So uh, this is a sauropod skull. Uh, the nares is up here. Uh, what we've seen on the theropod dinosaurs is that the nasal openings are where you kind of expect them to. Uh, the openings are much higher on the sauropod dinosaurs. Um, and it's kind of in a comparable location to uh, an elephant. Uh, and so elephants were actually somewhat interpreted, uh, might have been the rumor or the, the origins of the Cyclops myth because this large central hole here uh, was interpreted as possibly being an eye socket. It's actually their nostril where the trunk goes in. And so when we see this uh, situation in modern animals, they very often have trunks. And so there was a short-lived, uh, very controversial movement to sort of start putting trunks on these long-necked sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, again, like in elephants, elephants have short necks and the trunk is what gets them higher up in the trees. So to have both a long neck and a trunk is sort of redundant and kind of, uh, frankly, evolutionarily kind of stupid. Um, also looking at the dentition, uh, the trunk would be used for stripping vegetation and then put into the mouth. Uh, dinosauropod teeth show wear of they're actually chomping on the vegetation uh, and wearing off. So they're not using a trunk. Uh, so that interpretation is probably wrong. Uh, but where exactly the nostrils is, is still open for debate. So uh, if you watch Jurassic Park, the first Jurassic Park, uh, the dinosaur sneeze scene, uh, you'll notice that the nostrils are put way up on the forehead here, corresponding with the opening in the skull. Uh, that's a possible interpretation, although it's a little bit less likely. The nostrils are probably farther down on the skull. Uh, but not at the very tip, because again, they have to solve that drinking problem where when they dip their skull in, they don't want their nostrils in the water. And so it's probably a little bit farther back. And you can see there's actually a little divot, uh, a little fossa indent on the skull where the nostril probably actually is. But we don't have soft tissue preserved of the soft nose. So uh, we don't know per se, but it's probably uh, it's much more likely that it's lower on there. And this is probably uh, wrong. And uh, the sneeze scene is just kind of disgusting. <laughs> uh, and the last issue that we'll talk about, and then we'll start getting into examples, uh, is rearing. So there's a lot of debate about whether, uh, whether it's possible for sauropods to rear up 
onto their hind legs and kind of extend their necks upwards a little bit higher, uh, maybe even using the tail. So instead of being bipedal on their back legs and rearing up with their front legs in the air, or maybe resting up against a tree, uh, they might also use their tail as support in the back. Uh, the largest of the sauropods would likely just crush under their own weight if they tried this. Uh, their body plan is that the weight is bore on the four quadrupedal limbs. And if you put that all that weight on two limbs, uh, that's twice the amount of weight that they're used to, and it probably wouldn't work. Um, for the more vertical necked sauropods, uh, like for example, uh, this very large necked individual here, uh, rearing up on hind legs doesn't even really buy you that much. Uh, it increases the height by like maybe a third and not even really all that much. So uh, it's very difficult to do. Uh, it, it may cripple them uh, and it doesn't even really extend your neck range all that much. And you're already way up into the tree canopy anyways. So what's the, why would you bother? Uh, and then um, there's a little bit of debate about the full like range of sauropod necks and exactly how flexible they were. Uh, they're probably relatively stiff. stiff. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping of the bones in the neck. Uh, they're also probably very well muscled and including a lot of that spongy tissue that helps kind of pump the blood a little bit. Uh, the necks were mostly kind of lateral movement uh, rather than up and down. So they, all the different sauropods, there's a wide range of neck geometries. Uh, some tend to be more upright, some more level, and maybe some even a little bit more downwards. Uh, but they probably use the neck to kind of just move laterally to stop from having to move their feet all the time. Uh, so it's probably more like chomp, 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 chomp across than like chomp, 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 chomp up and down. Um, so um, again, why bother rearing up to do that if you're mostly browsing horizontally? All right, so let's look at some examples. So uh, the first one we're going to look at is Jobaria, which is, it's named after a mythical beast from the Berber culture. Uh, and it's a, it's a basal form. So again, as we've seen before, uh, these basal uh, initial forms, these more primitive forms, uh, they're going to share features of the earlier uh, clads and they're going to share features of the later more derived clads. And so this is known from the middle Jurassic of Niger in Africa. And if you look at the teeth, uh, it still shows these kind of spoon shaped teeth, uh, a little bit different than the leaf shaped teeth, but uh, these are uh, pretty typical herbivore teeth. Uh, used for probably eating leaves and soft vegetation. Uh, it's a transitional form to the later uh, macronaria, which means large nose after the big old nostril opening. Uh, they have more pencil-like teeth, uh, and they're probably actually stripping entire branches and actually eating like woody bits and leaves and everything all together. So uh, this forms probably eating just the leaves with this dentition, uh, and they're also probably still capable of rearing uh, as elephants are able to do and somewhat. Uh, so probably a similar lifestyle to that, um, but a little bit different than the more derived. Uh, Shunosaurus uh, is, uh, translates to Shu lizard, which is an uh, ancient name for the Sichuan province in China. Uh, it's unusual because it has sort of a relatively short neck for a sauropod. Uh, it's also not gigantic. Uh, I mean, this is a human for scale, so it's certainly large, uh, but it's not gigantic. It's not towering over this individual here. Uh, and another thing that's really neat is that it has at the end of its tail, uh, the, uh, there's some osteoderms on the end of the tail, some bony plates that sort of fuse together into a tail club which is something that we'll see later in the Ornithischian ankylosaurs. Uh, and it also has some tail, some kind of cone-shaped uh, spikes, which is something that we'll see later in the Ornithischian uh, stegosaurs. Uh, again, they're not directly related to each other. It's, these are the Saurischian dinosaurs uh, versus the Ornithischians, which we'll talk about later. Uh, they're on different evolutionary branches, but it's, again, probably an a, a example of convergent evolution. These things are not that large. They can't defend themselves just based on the fact that they're really huge. Uh, and so they need some kind of defense and they don't have sharp teeth. They don't have sharp claws. 
So uh, tail club and spikes seems like a really good idea. Uh, it's relatively rare in the sauropods, but this isn't the only example, uh, but it's probably one of the cooler examples. Uh, and again, if you look at the dentition, you're starting to see that transition from kind of that leaf-shaped teeth to the spoon-shaped teeth. Uh, this is sort of intermediate between like a spooning shape and kind of a pencil shape that we'll see later. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about the actual like uh, the neosauropoda the very derived forms where we actually see the teeth at only the very front of the snout uh, and we start to see the nostril opening kind of slide backwards on the head. Uh, and so we're going to kind of go up this branch here first, the diplo diplodesoidea, which includes uh, some more basal forms uh, and then into the diplodocids themselves. Uh, down here we have uh, kind of some gnawing herbivorous with possibly like a fleshy cheek. And by the time we get up here, uh, we really don't see that anymore. And so it's this trend away from uh, leafy browsing, leafy delicate browsing to just chomping off whole branches and just consuming wood and all and using your big old gut and probably some of those gastroliths, the stomach stones to grind up that material and digest slowly. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the dicry uh, dicryosaurus, uh, it translates to bifurcated lizard, uh, named for these kind of Y-shaped spines uh, at the back of their neck. Uh, if you look at the form here, so uh, this is dicryosaurus, uh, relatively short neck, uh, unusually short neck for a sauropod, uh, unusually large head for a sauropod, uh, and a relatively short tail for a diplodocid. So a lot of things that are sort of odd about this particular sauropod's body plan. And it shows you that the, all the dinosaurs that we're going to look at today are, are pretty similar in shape. Uh, the general body plan is pretty kind of locked in. Uh, there are subtle features that change, like elongated forelimbs, longer tails, slightly longer necks, uh, again, the pitch of the neck stance. Uh, but in general, they're pretty similar looking. Uh, this one's not. Uh, and some other slightly related forms have like a true crest on the back here. Uh, and uh, their dentition, you see now we're kind of at like the pencil shape teeth here. Uh, they're probably browsing, uh, again, they're not capable of browsing way up in the canopy. They're just shorter, they don't have the long neck. So uh, closer to the ground than most sauropods. And, and again, this is niche partitioning. This is the long necks are gonna browse the high canopy the middle or flatter necks are going to browse the middle, uh, and then the shorter necks are going to browse the st stuff in, in, the, in the bottom of the, the ground cover, uh, so like the ferns and things like that. Uh, all these large herbivores can coexist because they're not eating the same things. They're not competing for the same resources, uh, just as we see with, like again, Darwin's finches. All those different finches have all those different beaks to fill all those different niches, and so, so they're trying to avoid competition with each other. Uh, obviously, the most famous uh, example of the diplodocids is uh, Diplodocus itself. Uh, it translates to a double beam uh, after the V-shaped tail vertebrae. So you can see the tail vertebrae here with these kind of V-shaped extensions kind of coming down off of there. Uh, and it's uh, known from the late Jurassic Morrison formation of North America. So we've talked uh, previously about all of the dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. So there's uh, lots of other large herbivores here, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, uh, niche partitioning happening, or browsing different layers of the canopy, maybe different parts of the uh, area. Uh, and they, the thing that's characteristic of the diplodocids is uh, they have this whip, this long, slender, whip-like tail uh, and it may literally have been whip-like in that the end of the tail may have actually acted like a bull whip and maybe even had the sonic whip crack, the whoosh, which is actually the tip of the whip breaking the sound barrier. Uh, Diplodocus may have been able to do that with its tail. Uh, there's evidence that this was a defensive mechanism. So there's an Allosaurus fossils found with damage all down the same side of their body 
that they took a smack with this tail, potentially. Uh, again, it's really hard to link the smoking gun and the fossils with what happened, but it's a potential forensic analysis of that particular situation. Uh, so they're dealing in this environment with really large uh, Allosaurus and uh, Ceratosaurus, the horn, the single horn, uh, like Torvosaurus. So uh, there's large carnivores around. Uh, they're not going to run away from them. So they need to defend themselves with sheer body size. And uh, this tail is probably pretty formidable. Uh, going back to the cladogram, we're going to talk here about some of the Brachiosauridae. So obviously, the uh, most famous example of Brachiosauridae is Brachiosaurus itself. Uh, but it's currently referred to as mostly as Giraffa Titan, although they probably are actually separate now. Uh, that translates to Titanic Giraffe, uh, obviously for uh, pretty plain why. So we talked earlier about the giraffe as sort of an analog to these long-necked sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, giraffe Titan seems like a pretty good name for one. It's known from the late Jurassic of the Tendaguru Formation uh, in Tanzania and Africa, which we've talked about before. Uh, very closely related to North America's Brachiosaurus, which means arm lizard, uh, because they have these sort of weirdly long front arms. Uh, their forelimbs are longer than their back limbs, and it actually sort of pitches their body uh, up at an angle, and then the neck just kind of extends up that angle. So uh, their neck just kind of naturally follows the flow of their spine in sort of an oriented degree. So they're always kind of neutrally just browsing high in the foliage without actually having to extend a whole lot of effort to keep their neck up there because it's already pointed that direction. Uh, if this giraffe titan, which is a truly massive animal, uh, here's a human for scale, uh, if it followed a warm-blooded growth curve, it would take about 10 years for them to reach their full size. Uh, remember that all dinosaurs, uh, even these massive sauropod dinosaurs come from eggs, and the largest dinosaur egg is about the size of a basketball. So these are not coming from gigantic eggs. They have to grow to these sizes quickly. Uh, 10 years if they're warm-blooded. Uh, if they were cold-blooded and followed cold-blooded growth curves, uh, it would be more like 100 years, uh, which is not, probably not possible. These things probably didn't live that long. Uh, so probably somewhere in between, uh, probably mesothermic. Uh, again, with the thermal inertia, just they're going to maintain their body temperature uh, just on the basis of their size. Uh, and if they're even somewhat endothermic, somewhat trending towards warm-blooded, that means that they have a higher metabolism, they have higher energy demands to sort of try to regulate that temperature, which means they need a truly massive amount of food. Uh, they probably had to browse nonstop for their entire waking hours to sustain enough food. Uh, and again, if you look at the teeth on here, the teeth are only at the front and they're pencil-like, so they're more like fingers. Uh, therefore, kind of shearing off entire branches and just eating the whole thing. Uh, they're not picking individual leaves and grinding it in their mouth and slowly chewing, like we'll see with some of the more advanced hadrosaur. The duck-billed dinosaurs are very efficient chewers uh, with fleshy cheeks to kind of keep the food in the mouth and do a lot of the processing in the mouth. Uh, this is just swallowing branches whole and letting the stomach do the work, which means you need a big old gut and you need some big old feet and some big old legs to hold up that big old gut. Uh, and that's just kind of the body plan for these sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, another very famous example of these is Apatosaurus, uh, formerly Brontosaurus. Uh, for the longest time, uh, Brontosaurus was actually considered invalid and you'd often get corrected for saying Brontosaurus, like, no, 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 it's Apatosaurus. Uh, but now, as of 2015, uh, there's enough evidence that they probably are actually different animals. Uh, but Apatosaurus means deceptive lizard uh, because they have this unusual V-shaped vertebrae at the tail, like that other example that we saw, that kind of downward splitting V, uh, which is very similar to Mosasaur tails and other uh, lizards. And so it sort of threw off the path of the dinosaurs. Uh, they're known from the late Jurassic of Colorado from North America, and it was initially discovered by our good friend uh, Edward Drinker Cope during the Bone Wars. 
And of course, as luck would have it, O.C. Marsh, uh, you know, Charles Marsh, uh, discovered Brontosaurus, which translates to Thunder Lizard, at roughly the same time. And uh, again, originally they were named as different species, uh, and their cursory kind of haphazard rush to publish everything out, name as many dinosaurs as we possibly can. Uh, they didn't realize how closely related they were, uh, but they probably actually are separate animals. So uh, Brontosaurus is one that we all kind of learned growing up. Uh, it actually is now a valid name again. So Apatosaurus, formerly Brontosaurus, uh, they're actually two different uh, animals, probably anyways. Uh, and again, you see uh, the pencil-like teeth only in the front, this very large jaw gape able to open up their mouths quite large, uh, probably no fleshy cheeks for holding stuff in the mouth as they chew. They're just chomping down whole branches, swallowing whole and processing in the gut. Uh, the last uh, category we're going to talk about here are the, uh, the titanosaurs uh, and the lithostrodions. Uh, so Malawisaurus, an example of this, translates to Malawi lizard. It's a, it's a dinosaur from Malawi in Africa, uh, from the early Cretaceous. Uh, and it's a relatively small titanosaur. And again, when we're talking about sauropods, small is relative. Uh, this is still a very large animal, but here's a human for scale. It's not at the size of some of these other things. Uh, this group is called uh, Lithostrodia. That translates to stone skin uh, because they actually have these uh, bony osteoderms or scutes, kind of like these bony scales, uh, like you find in modern crocodiles, those ridges down the back. Uh, those are osteoderms. Uh, we'll see this dramatically in the ankylosaurs, uh, this towards armor, uh, but uh, they don't have the whip tail. Uh, they don't have sharp claws. Uh, they do have body mass, but they need to defend themselves somehow and kind of armoring the skin a little bit with these bony plates is a pretty good way to do it. Um, and again, relatively rare skull material from these. Uh, mostly we find leg bones, uh, vertebrae, some of the more robust bones. Uh, the skull is relatively fragile, relatively easily lost, uh, but this skull material does show these dramatic kind of pencil-like teeth, uh, almost looks like carnivorous teeth. They're very pointy, very, uh, but you see they're a little bit more blunt uh, and they sort of like interlock a little bit more closely. Uh, they're for, again, like shearing off vegetation rather than like ripping and tearing flesh. Uh, probably the coolest example, I guess, of these sauropods is uh, Dreadnoughtus. So Dreadnoughtus uh, translates to fears nothing. So it dreads not. Uh, because it's, it's just enormous. Uh, it's a colossal size. Uh, it's probably the heaviest land animal ever, uh, although there's a couple contenders that are pretty close. Uh, it's from the late Cretaceous of the Cerro Fortaleza formation in Argentina. And again, there is some debate over whether it's the heaviest dinosaur. Of all the candidates for heaviest dinosaur, uh, it's the one that has the most skeletal material. So uh, again, when we're trying to reconstruct like the body weight of an animal from just the bones, uh, we don't have any of the musculature, we don't know how much fat there was, uh, especially with the sauropods, uh, we don't know the extent of the air sacs fully. Uh, and so it's really the, the error bars on the mass calculations are, are pretty large. Uh, obviously, the more material that you have, the smaller those error bars are, but there's still a lot of range from the high end to the low end of the predictions. And so it makes it difficult to say like, ah, yes, this is the most massive. Because again, uh, a lot of these very large sauropods are pretty similar in size, probably butting up against the highest possible size that the tetrapod quadrupedal land animal design can possibly ever support. Uh, and Dreadnoughtus you see here has an unusually long neck. It's approximately half of its body size. Uh, and so this probably is the heaviest land animal ever, uh, but even compared to a blue whale, uh, it's about a third of the weight of blue whale. Uh, you see the relative length here too. Blue whales are the largest animal on earth now, and they're probably the largest animal that ever existed uh, because they live in the water and they don't need to support their weight. Uh, they also don't have as much trouble with getting rid of heat because they're always in the water. So they're able to cheat a little bit. Uh, but Dreadnought is probably the heaviest animal to ever exist. Uh, Argentinosaurus is another candidate. Um, 
In this case, it's probably for longest known land animal. Uh, it translates to Argentina lizard from the late Cretaceous of Argentina. Uh, when it was first discovered by a local farmer, uh, the leg bones, they're so massive, uh, they were actually mistaken for petrified trees or logs. Uh, and you see here kind of why. Here's a paleontologist working on reconstructing these bones here. <laughs> That's the lower leg bone, so it's not even the more, most robust of the leg bones, and it's basically taller than he is. Uh, they're also in the conversation for heaviest land animal. Uh, we see some of the length. Uh, diplodocids are much more, uh, much smaller, but because they have that long whip-like tail, they're kind of cheating here. Uh, and so uh, Diplodocus is probably uh, pretty close to as long as Argentinosaurus, but Argentinosaurus weighs significantly more. Uh, Supersaurus is in the conversation here as well. Alamosaurus, which we're going to talk about next, is in the conversation. Uh, but again, we see convergence on this kind of max size. Uh, we don't usually look at these dinosaurs from above, but we need to keep in mind that uh, these 2D flat representations, uh, there is a third dimension here. Uh, and you see kind of how broad they are. And you see the legs kind of way out to the side in these massive titanosaurs. Uh, really kind of almost uh, not a dinosaur-like hip anymore. Really kind of that uh, pillar erect kind of stature that we saw earlier. So again, a, an adept, a convergent uh, evolution thing going on there. Uh, and the last one that we're going to talk about is Alamosaurus. Uh, it's not actually named after the Alamo in Texas, it's named after the Ojo Alamo Formation uh, in New Mexico, but it might also be a nod to the Alamo, just happy coincidence. Uh, and it is an interesting name because it is the last and also the largest sauropod uh, in North America. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, the Jurassic is a time of relatively humid, relatively mild weather. Uh, it's definitely hotter than it is now, but it's not as hot as it was in the early Triassic, and it's not as hot as it's going to get in the Cretaceous. Uh, sauropods kind of dominate in that Jurassic mild temperature. Uh, they sort of go out of fashion in the Cretaceous, and in a lot of places they're outcompeted by the duckbill dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs, with their much more efficient grinding uh, teeth with cheeks. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to Ornithischians, uh, but they're definitely not gone. Uh, there are gaps, though, uh, in North America where there are no records of sauropods in North America. Uh, potentially, Alamosaurus might have migrated up from South America. Uh, we see all that with some more modern animals crossing across land bridges. Uh, this may have happened here as well, or we just might not have a lot of material from this uh, particular period in time. Remember, the fossil record is not perfect. Uh, just because we don't find something doesn't mean that it's necessarily not there or that it didn't necessarily exist. But uh, these things, uh, since they are the last of the sauropods in North America, they make it all the way right up to the extinction event. And they're living alongside of some very famous dinosaurs like uh, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus rex. So they're living in an environment with Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, you see here the size comparison. This is a fully adult Alamosaurus here versus a full adult Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, it takes a truly colossal animal to make Tyrannosaurus rex look small. Uh, again, there's a person for scale here. Tyrannosaurus rex is very big, uh, probably not the largest of the theropods. Spinosaurus was probably a little bigger. Uh, there's others that may have been a little bit bigger, but Tyrannosaurus rex is pushing up against that maximum size for a carnivorous bipedal theropod dinosaur. Alamosaurus is pushing up against it for the quadrupedal form, and you see just how much bigger it is. Uh, T-Rex was probably not capable of taking down a full adult uh, Alamosaurus, uh, and if it was, it came at substantial risk to the Tyrannosaurus rex and was probably avoided, uh, but they were definitely preying on juvenile individuals and probably scavenging on the corpses, the larger corpses. Uh, but uh, again, here, uh, because of the size discrepancy, they're often pictured as kind of hunting together in packs to take down this large animal. Uh, remember that uh, although T. rex is probably relatively one of the smarter dinosaurs, uh, it's really probably not capable of complex coordination and acting in packs. Uh, we don't find T. rexes moving together 
Uh, we don't find evidence of pack behavior, uh, but it's often put in paleo art just so that T-Rex stands a chance against this large animal. Uh, it would look kind of silly taking it on by itself. Uh, so uh, again, looking at these dinosaur forms, Triassic, relatively small body size, Platyosaurus, the largest of the Triassic dinosaurs. Then we get into the big old sauropods, uh, but by the end in the Cretaceous, uh, it's mostly the hadrosaur, duck-billed dinosaurs that take over. Uh, only last remnants like Alamosaurus make it all the way to the end with Tyrannosaurus. You don't see any sauropods pictured here uh, in the Cretaceous. So uh, that's all I got for today. That's all we got for this week. That's all we got for this module. I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you next time.